Welcome to the Retiring Real Estate Investor Podcast, where we will discuss how to defer taxes on the sale of your property, earning passive real estate income, and everything you need to know to go from active investor to passive investor. Join us as we interview passive investment sponsors, explore the journey of other retiring real estate investors, and share our due diligence process we perform to select passive investments. Investment advisory services provided by Insight Investment Advisors, LLC, a registered investment advisor. This podcast is only intended for clients and interested investors residing in the states in which we are registered to provide investment advisory services or exempt from registration. Please contact us to determine if the firm provides investment advisory services in the state where you reside. All content on this podcast is for informational purposes only and should not be considered investment advice. Material presented is believed to be reliable sources, and no representations are made by our firm as to another party's informational accuracy or completeness. Insight Investment Advisors LLC and its representatives do not provide tax or legal advice, and nothing herein should be construed as such. Always consult with your tax advisor or attorney regarding your specific circumstances. Hello, everyone, and welcome to another episode of the Retiring Real Estate Investor Podcast. I'm your host, Brandon Bruckman. Uh, I'm honored to be joined by Tom Dunkel from uh, Bellrose Storage Group. You're the Chief Investment Officer over at, at Bellrose. And we were just chatting before we started. I And I'm looking at your LinkedIn profile right now. I think we got a lot in common about, um, quote, helping miserable landlords. <laughs> <laughs> but right to it, like no sugar coating, like we're That's going right. right after the pain points and talking about them where we sort of feel the same way about who we're helping. So Tom, thanks for joining us. That's right. Yeah, Brandon. That's, I mean, honestly, that was me. I was a miserable landlord and I had to find a better way. So uh, I'm sure we'll be talking about my journey here today, but it's great to be with you. And I, and I'm, and I hope my story will help, help the audience because uh, it does seem like your audience and kind of my experience and who I'm trying to help, you know, matches up perfectly. So I love that. Let's start there. <laughs> um, we want to give our listeners sure. sort of your background and, and where you kind of came from um, to, to reach this point. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, yeah, so I'm Tom Dunkel. I'm Chief Investment Officer here at Bellrose Storage Group, but I haven't been in storage you know, all my life. I actually started out in, uh, in corporate America uh, after business school, I was doing uh, mergers and acquisitions in the aerospace industry. So that was amazing. I was uh, surrounded by uh, just some extremely accomplished and inspirational kind of people, uh, Harvard MBAs, Wharton MBAs. X fighter pilots, you know, astronauts, you know, that, so the aerospace industry just kind of attracts those kinds of people. And we were growing the company aggressively through acquisitions. So I was a, a senior financial analyst. I'm running all these models and projections. You know, we were, we were, uh, you know, raising private equity from huge firms. We were raising big money from banks. Like I have a, I have a tombstone here on my uh, on my windowsill for a hundred and forty million dollar credit facility that we put in place to to help with our growth and uh, so anyway so just really cut my teeth early on doing deals doing big deals and um, but I was making other people branded I was making other people a lot of money uh, which was fine at the time because I was happy to just be learning 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 and building that foundation but eventually I want I knew that I wanted to go out and do my own thing and, you know, and have my own company. So, you know, fast forward to 2006 after, you know, doing a bunch more deals and doing some investment banking in there. Um, I actually got fired <laughs> from my corporate job in 2006. And uh, actually it had been the, the third time, I think in four years that I had lost my job either from, you know, layoffs or whatever. And so I was like, all right, this is the sign, you know, this it's time, you know, I'm tired of, putting my, you know, livelihood, my destiny in somebody else's hands. And of course, you know, 2006, I had a wife and two babies at home. I'm like, all right, I got to do something here, make, make something happen. So uh, I jump into real estate um, and, you know, because I did have a pretty successful corporate career, I had accumulated some money that was like my war chest. I was going to go, you know, conquer uh, the real estate world, but <laughs> the great recession had uh, other ideas for me. And, uh, so I ended up, you know, just getting my butt whooped those next uh, few years, uh, you know, seven, eight, nine, 
And so there I am having, you know, burned through all this cash that I accumulated because uh, I was trying to be a landlord. I was trying to do fix and flips. I was trying to do wholesaling in the residential space. And it was just, you know, between my lack of experience and just the market working against me, it was just kind of the perfect storm. <laughs> But it was around about that time, Brandon, in 20, 2009, I started learning about distressed mortgage debt. In 2010, I connected with my business partner, Joe Downs. We've, we've been business partners now 14 years. And uh, our first business that we built was U.S. Mortgage Resolution, which is a distressed mortgage debt company. And so uh, thankfully, we were able, you know, after the crash, you know, there was all kinds of distressed mortgages around. So we were able to grow that business. And so we've done over $55 million of revenue in that business over that time period, and that's, which has been awesome. It's allowed us to do other things, um, get into different asset classes, explore other businesses. Um, and the, the thing is, with distressed mortgage debt, for, it's super volatile, right? So it's like when the banks are selling, it's selling bad loans, it's great. But you know, banks are under a lot of regulation, and of course, they're balance sheets ebb and flow with the economy with their bad loans. So it's very unpredictable kind of uh, kind of business. So when it's good, it's like super good. When it's bad, it's like bone dry. Mm -hmm. And so we were looking for an asset class that was going to help us smooth out our, our business so that we could, you know, sleep at night <laughs> and, mm -hmm. uh, you know, tell our families, you know, where our, where our, you know, income was going to be coming from. So, you know, we looked at, uh, we looked at hard money lending. We look. We were partners in a title company for a little bit. Short term rentals. We've done a little bit of, uh, but it wasn't until we found self storage that we were like, hey, you know, this asset class really checks a lot of boxes for us. You know, so 2017 we started learning about it. 2018 we started going to all the conferences, getting educated. 2019 we joined a mastermind, self storage mastermind group of of owner operators at, you know nationwide. So we started learning from those people. And it, 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 through that process, it identified some holes in our team, right? So Joe and I are good, like deal guys, like uh, we can raise the money, we can do the projections, we can do all that stuff, but we had trouble on the front end finding good deals. And then of course, once we find a good deal and we're able to, you know, analyze it, raise the money and close it, now we got to run the thing. <laughs> so we had no idea how to run a self storage facility. So we had to fill in that part of the team as well. So once we routed out the team and, and filled in those those missing skill sets, then we were able to go out to the uh, world with confidence and acquire our first facility in 2020. And then last week we we final finally it took a while, but we closed on our 16th acquisition. So we've now um, acquired over 600,000 square feet of self storage across eight states, uh, worth about you know 46 million dollars. So. You know, we've been able to build a nice business along the way too. We've we've been able to continue to build out the team, mm -hmm. so we have uh, a solid team, and uh, we're able to deliver great returns to our investors because we have the experience, we have the team, we're in a great asset class, and we've been able to to deliver. So we're happy about that. No, that's awesome. Thanks for sharing that, Tom. I want to go back to sure. that first experience, your M and A experience. Yeah. Are there aspects of that that help you today in the business that you're running now? And sort of what are those? Walk us through that a little bit. Yeah, hundred um, it, percent. It's it's almost all applicable. It's because right, right. First thing we have to do is go find. Uh, we had to go find companies that fit what we were looking for. So you know that of course translates to self storage because we're looking for value add opportunities in the eastern U.S certain size. So, you know, so I had that experience with, you know, researching the market back then um, to find suitable uh, acquisition targets. And then once you engage with the target, I mean, that was at the time that was, you know, way above my pay grade, you know, that was at the CEO, CEO level, you know, the Harvard guys talking and everything. Um, but once the deal was under contract, you know, now we're, you know, we're doing due diligence and mm -hmm. we're arranging the financing. So we have our whole, you know, projections and we have like a deal, uh, a deal package, you know, an investor deck, if you will, that we were circulating around to private equity firms and to banks. And so, so all of that is exactly the same. We do the same thing here at Bellrose Storage Group. We're, we're putting our models together. So all of that really transitions over as does the um, integration aspect. So of course, when you're acquiring a, a business and you have to bring it under your company, right? You have to integrate the 
uh, accounting systems and, you know, all the other management systems and all those kinds of things. So we, our operations team, you know, now after doing all these uh, deals, you know, we're, we're experts now at integrating these new self-storage facilities into the Bellrose Storage Group uh, system. So we have sophisticated uh, management platforms and, you know, we, all, we use all kinds of cool technology like, uh, sorry, you can't really see oh, it. Oh, there it is. Background. Yep. So, like, if you wanted to, that all translates over, like, perfectly. Um, and so that I'm, I'm glad that I had that experience early in my career because I've just been able to, you know, kind of build on that uh, ever since. And I asked the question with, <laughs> may she better to do right, things sure. in a better way um, and to meet a standard um, that yep. that was higher, which was great. And so I think those are, mm -hmm. I was, like I said, I have a similar experience there, too. Um and it just, it sort of made me better. So it's interesting to hear that you had that yep. sort of experience too, um, of working through that. Um, let's spin to storage a little bit. Um, sure. Are there certain geographies that, that you guys have a specific focus on? How do you think about that in terms of, you mentioned sort of wrapping in those new facilities, the synergies, right, of wrapping in some of those new facilities into your existing model. Is that geographic based or is that more about Hey, I love this area and this deal. Different angles. Uh, number one is kind of a top down. So we are, you know, one of the big drivers of self storage is population growth, residential real estate transactions, you know, that kind of thing. So we're looking for growing markets, right? So a lot of those, uh, you know, just if we're talking about major demographic trends in our country, Folks are moving to the southeast and the south, right? So we're uh, we're generally looking kind of in that area, and that's where our portfolio has has kind of blossomed is down uh, kind of the east coast, and then we have one in Kentucky, and we have an out kind of an outlier out in Minnesota. But that came to us through four or five years. Came to us said, "Hey, do you want to partner on this deal?" He's like, "I'll run it. You guys do everything." <laughs> so I said, "Oh, okay, great." So, uh, you know, another good thing about being, you know, kind of out in the self-storage network and masterminds and stuff is those kinds of opportunities uh, come across your path. But as back to acquisitions, we're definitely looking for markets that are growing where the um, income is pretty solid. You know, we, we want to avoid areas where there's high poverty. Uh, we like areas where there's a decent amount of uh, renters as compared to owners because renters are typically you know, renting smaller spaces, but they still have all their stuff. So they're good candidates to be self-storage customers. Mm -hmm. um, we're looking for markets where there's infrastructure investments being made. So, you know, new roads and highways and ramps and, you know, commercial buildings and those kinds of things are going in because those commercial influencers are, are going to bring people and bring dollars and bring demand for, for self-storage. Uh, so we definitely look at a top down. And when we find an area that we like, uh, we basically um, acquire a list of self-storage owners in that market, whether it's, you know, there's tons of list brokers out there. We also have resources and databases um, that we subscribe to where we can build our own lists. Mm -hmm. And then we give those uh, those lists to our, um, our, we actually have a virtual assistant in the Philippines who smiles and dials and reaches out and calls all those facilities. If she gets kind of of a warm response, then it comes to our in-house uh, acquisitions team. And, and our guy, Jack, you know, kind of takes it to the next step and gets starts getting some high-level due diligence materials. And then if, if that's looking good, then he brings in my partner, Joe, who's ultimately in charge of acquisitions. And he, um, you know, kind of gets the deal to, to work or not work. Um, so we do have that top down from acquisitions. The other thing we do... Uh, which has been really helpful is um, we do what we call direct market expansion. So what that means is that when we acquire a facility, let's say in North Carolina, we're going to look at all the facilities within like a 30, 40, 50 mile radius of that facility. And we're going to reach out to them. And we're never saying, hey, sell us your facility. It's always just kind of a softer like, hey, we just bought this facility in Roanoke Rapids. Just wanted to let you know we're here. And, you know, tell us about your business. We'll tell you about our business. Hey, and if, if we have a customer that's, you know, looking for a 10 by 15, we don't have one. Can we refer them over to you? Oh, and vice versa. Yeah, and vice versa. So we just sort of start to build that rapport. But inevitably, that discussion ends up like, well, hey, do you guys think if, if it's the right timing, they might say, hey, would you guys consider buying my facility? Mm -hmm. So we come at, come at it that way as well. And here's a huge, here's a huge tidbit. 
mm. for anyone out there looking to acquire a self storage facility, especially in today's market. This has been something that we've implemented that's worked really well. Um, go on a road trip. <laughs> you know, we're, we're acquiring facilities from these mom and pop owners mm -hmm. and, you know, they're getting pummeled with, you know, direct mail and phone calls and all this stuff and brokers, you know, if not, not just uh, owner operators like us, but brokers. So, you know, these, these moms and pops, they hate that. And so they kind of shrink back into their shell and they don't respond to anybody. But I tell you what, if you go to their facility and you knock on their door and you sit there and have a cup of coffee with them, you know, it's going to open, it's going to break down those walls. And so my partner, Joe, uh, he's actually in Georgia as we speak, uh, doing a little bit of a road trip. He's, you know, boots on the ground. He's set up some appointments, but then he's just going to do some other drop buys. And I guarantee you, we're going to, we're going to get some, some business out of that because again, these moms and pops, they like doing business the old fashioned way. A lot of times, you know, they like to see eye to high, eye to eye, sit knee yeah. to knee, whatever. And um, so that's that's definitely uh, paid dividends for us uh, in this, because right now the market's a little a little choppy with the capital markets being expensive and all the other stuff going on in the world. So um, so we found that that helps to kind of break down those walls and, and open up the discussion. Is that still the, the main person or people that, is that how you characterize who you're buying from mainly is still mom and pops? It feels like there's been some consolidation of this space from mm -hmm. your REITs and things of that nature, private equity in here too. Mm -hmm. um, but is it still a mom and pop based business? That's such a great question, Brandon, because you're spot on. Most people, if you said, Hey, you know, we're getting into self storage you know, they think, Oh, well, man, you're going up against these behemoths. You know, you're going up against public yeah. storage and extra space and cube smart and all the, you know, all these big massive companies. Well, guess what? Those companies that I just listed, they only control about 35% of the self-storage market. About 65% of the market is still onesie, twosie uh, facility owners. And guess what? They're not going to the masterminds. They're not going to the uh, to the industry events. They're not staying up to date with the best practices in self-storage. So what ends up happening is they're not running their store uh, efficiently. And so they're they're leaving a lot of money on the table. So when Bellrose comes in with our proven value add strategies and our management systems and platforms and our great people, mm -hmm. we're able to take that same self-storage facility and turn it around and really crank up the, the profitability of that facility, which is ultimately what drives the value of the facility and, and drives returns for our investors. Gotcha. So that, that dynamic still exists because I remember having this conversation about that dynamic maybe mm -hmm five, six, seven years ago. And I'm like, wow, when is this going to change? Like at some point it does, yeah. it has to, right? Uh, yeah. There's a lot of folks hunting for, for storage, but it's still there. That's a very good thing. It's going to take see? a while. <laughs> yeah. If, if we're yeah. if we're sitting knee to knee, darn right. It's going to take a while for, for that. Change. Yeah. Right. That's right. It's yeah, going mean, to be timely to do it. There's still uh, about 40,000 mom and pop owned self storage facilities out there. So okay. kind of, so it'll take a minute. And, yeah. <laughs> and you, when I think about those onesies, twosies, some of those are, are pretty far below the radar of what would even matter to a REIT at that point. Is that part of what you think about as an exit strategy is accumulating these ones and twos into a portfolio and thinking about selling that to a REIT? Is that a, is that a realistic exit strategy? Uh, I, I mean, part one of your question is a realistic exit strategy, which is accumulating a portfolio. I, I don't think the, the facilities that we're buying, because we are we're buying in secondary and tertiary markets. So these are smaller markets, you know, less densely populated. We're buying kind of class C facilities, which are, you know, a lot of them are just single story drive up, you know, ugly. <laughs> you know, they're not the fancy ones yeah. that a public storage would want to plant their flag on. Yeah. Um, but we are accumulating a portfolio and there are plenty of what we call, um, you know, there's kind of these, you know, kind of middle operators like right underneath the REITs. Mm -hmm. um, there's, you know, I'm, I'm here outside Philadelphia and we're good friends uh, with a company that's, you know, a stone's throw for from here, they they don't want to acquire value add self storage. Hmm. They have a fund, and they just pay their investors in their fund just a, a certain uh, coupon payment, if you will. And so they don't want to do the heavy lifting of uh, of you know turning the facility around and getting the cash flow up. They they want to buy from us because oh, okay. we're already going to have the stabilized portfolio of facilities throwing off a certain amount of cash flow so their analysis is pretty easy they're hey you know your 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 facilities are throwing off you know 10% cash on cash great we're going to acquire it 
we're going to uh, pay our investors 7% and we're going to clip 3%. And, you know, that's their business model. And mm -hmm. the, there are plenty of buyers out there uh, for stabilized portfolios, not just the REITs. Oh, I love it. I love the idea of this sort of natural, I, I started calling it the life cycle of real estate. I don't know. This isn't a fully baked idea, but we're going to go with it anyways. Um, <laughs> but these things, these things have over time from development to, to you guys are doing the improvement on those facilities to the next owner. And then there's probably another owner after that, and maybe another owner after that with different economic profiles and needs and construct that they approach the space with that's different, but all of it creates the opportunity for us to have economics and value. And so I like, I like to understand that. Does that make any damn sense at all? <laughs> no, it actually, up? no, it actually does. And it, to <laughs> me, it boils down to cost of capital, right? So, you know, we're, yes. let's face it. I mean, I love our company, but we're a small boutique, you know, self-storage owner operator. So we're kind of at the bottom of the food chain, right? So yeah. our capital is more expensive, but the next guy, if they have, if they have less expensive capital, they're going to be able to pay more for the facilities. So that's going to create value for us to sell to them. And then I'm sure there's some bigger fish up upstream from them that has even cheaper capital. And then they're going to be able to pay more for that facility, that portfolio. And so on and not so no i think there's definitely layers to um you know the that value chain if you want to call it that yeah maybe it's a stream we got to work on this analogy we, okay we'll, let's work, work on this a little bit we'll get some visuals going have some yeah good. totally but work yeah. in progress on that help me on on storage some of the demand drivers um i was concerned when i read i read a lot of national reports on storage mm -hmm. and embedded question there is tell me how that's not really helpful when you think about these individual markets but the broader question is how should i think about demand drivers with less people leaving their homes less of that turnover used to be a huge demand driver for storage yep. are there other demand drivers that are filling that gap how should i think about mm -hmm. that and then how should i think about and relate some of this national report and narrative to what you see in maybe your local markets yeah, uh, another great question, Brandon. Uh, this is something that's definitely impacted our industry, you know, the last, uh, call it 12 months, right? So when when interest rates went crazy last year, you know, went through the roof, all of a sudden, residential, you know, people who are maybe thinking of moving are like, I'm not going to sell my house that has like a 3% mortgage on it and go buy a house with a 7% mortgage, because guess what, I'm not going to be able to buy as nice a house or whatever. And so people are choosing to stay. And that, as you could see in, in self-storage, not just our portfolio, but the industry-wide, um, definitely had a negative impact uh, last year. So occupancy went down. Mm -hmm. And and as a result, you know, self-storage competitors were like, oh, well, we need to offer lower rates to gap to capture those, you know, fewer customers that are available out there. And so it was kind of a, a little bit of a spiral downward. Uh, which we definitely felt in our portfolio, and it was it was felt across the industry. So you're you're spot on that in in our analysis, uh, about 25 30 percent of our customers are in some kind of residential real estate transition, mm. and so that that hurt us for sure, uh, mm. as well as everyone else. But the way we've been uh, combating that is number one, even before last year. And as I've touched on a couple of times in our in our conversation today, you know, we've really been building out our operational expertise and our technology platforms and that kind of thing. So one of the one of the things we've I guess there's a couple of key things that we've implemented to help mitigate that risk. One is um, we are using what's called dynamic pricing. Mm -hmm. So when uh, just so just simply put, you know, instead of like a blanket. 10%, you know, increase in rates across our uh, facility units, uh, the pricing, um, we'll take more of a surgical, you know, scalpel kind of approach and say, okay, you know, all of our, uh, all of our five by tens and 10 by tens are full, but, you know, we seem to have um, a bunch of, you know, 10 by twenties that are uh, vacant. So we're going to lower the price on those, but we're going to increase the price on the five by tens and the 10 by tens, because in this market, for whatever reason, those seem to be more in demand. These larger units seem to be less in demand or vice versa, whatever it is. We do these sophisticated analyses of the, of the supply and demand in our markets to kind of come up with that um, strategy. And actually, we're starting to implement a software program, of course, that can help us analyze 
uh, our facility as compared to our competitors and see where we need to adjust pricing. Mm -hmm. And the beautiful thing with self storage is, you know, we're, we're really just doing one month leases, right? Mm -hmm. So our, our leases are month to month to month to month. So theoretically we could lower or increase our rates uh, every month to kind of fit what's going on in the supply and demand world. Now, of course, we don't want to be increasing our rates on customers every month because that's a bad customer experience and that you know that might cause them to leave us and we don't want that. So we're you know we're we're strategic about how we, how we handle that. Mm -hmm. So um, so the pricing aspect is one way we we've, we've really gotten sophisticated to try to capture the demand even when things are softening. The other thing we're doing, which is really exciting and something we see as a as a real uh, opportunity for growth for our company in future is is commercial storage. Mm. So instead of relying on residential customers who are you know moving and maybe not moving, um, we're shifting. We're trying to we're trying to shift our revenue mix from virtually 100 percent residential to, you know, we're going to try over time to maybe get it down to maybe 75% residential, 25% commercial. Because if you think about it, you know, there's landscapers, there's, you know, plumbers, you know, there's electricians, there's all, you know, carpenters that they all have these, uh, you know, they all ha have expensive equipment, they have materials, a lot of them got screwed during COVID, because when the supply chain got messed up, and all those ships were parked off California out in the ocean, they couldn't get in the port, you know, that that caused a lot of these contractors to, it just threw off their businesses, mm. threw off the timing, you know, mad customers. I mean, we were part of that. We were in the middle of a expansion yeah. at uh, our Lynchburg, Virginia facility, and we just couldn't get the materials. Mm. So now in, what's going on is these contractors are accumulating these materials and their equipment, everything they need, and they're storing it instead of waiting for kind of the just in time kind of thing. Mm -hmm. And so that's created this opportunity for us to focus on, on attracting those customers. So when we do our Facebook uh, ge geographically based ads, um, we are not just targeting folks who might be uh, moving. We're targeting those contractors, the pharmaceutical representative, you know, the, the state, uh, the, um, home-based e-commerce business, you know, people selling clothes and whatever on Poshmark or Amazon or what have you. So we're, we're really trying to capture more of that uh, type of revenue because it's going to be less dependent on, you know, what's happening in the, in kind of the consumer economy. I always, I, there's a couple of things that we, we say to clients about storage. Like there's always there's always a demand somewhere. And it's so interesting how you're, you're trying to diversify that. And, and can you, are you able to do that? That's the same facility. Really, this is a marketing effort of who to target, correct? It is. Uh, yes and no. We do have our, our more traditional facilities. It is the 10 by 10s and the 10 by 15s and whatnot. But we actually, uh, Brandon, last year, we, and this is kind of how we stumbled into this idea, uh, last year, we acquired a, uh, a facility in Wilmington, North Carolina, that was 80% 80, 80 of the units were used by contractors. And that's because these were larger format units. So instead of a 10 by 10 with an eight foot roll up door, these are 18 by 25 with a 14 foot roll up door. And so they could pull their van in there. They could pull their truck in there. They could store a lot more equipment in there. They could run their business out of this larger format facility. So when when we saw what was going on there and we saw that there was really not a lot of supply of this type of unit and that there was huge demand. And we knew that because when we would get someone moving out, the contractor in the unit next door would call up their buddy and say, hey, one of these units came came uh, available. You need to jump on it. And so instead of charging them four fifty a month, then we were charging five hundred. Then instead of five hundred, we started charging six hundred. Six hundred. <laughs> now we're literally less than a year later, we're charging what was four hundred fifty dollars a month. We're charging nine hundred dollars a month for that unit because we're able to work the supply and demand curve and kind of see where that equilibrium level is but it's so that whole experience really opened our eyes to this niche within the self storage niche which is contractor storage interesting so it is it is it could change your acquisition strategy in the way that you sort of look at that does it lend itself mm -hmm. towards new development 
of storage facilities in specific markets to meet this demand? Is that something that you think you guys will venture into? Yes, 100%. Uh, we are looking at uh, developing these types of facilities because there's just not a lot of them around. I mean, we found them and we're in in contact with the owners, but they're like, what are you, crazy? <laughs> I'm not, I'm <laughs> not selling. Time. They're loving it, right? Exactly. <laughs> they're right? happy not, landlords. <laughs> yeah, I'm not selling this facility, right? Because if you think back to our conversation a minute ago where the you know interest rates went up and the homeowners are like, well, I'm not selling. Or I'm not moving. So what are they going to do? They're going to fix the bathroom. They're going to upgrade the kitchen. You know, they're going to replace the deck, right? So now all of these trades are 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 going to be that much busier, you know, going forward, at least through this next period of time. It's very interesting. Let's go back to um, I find the dynamic pricing, revenue management stuff fascinating. So maybe mm -hmm. a deeper, mm -hmm. deeper question on that. Um you mentioned maybe bringing on um, a technology to do that. What does that look like in terms of the landscape? Are there commonly used so revenue management systems across the industry, or have some folks kind of developed their own in house? Um, how is that? What does that look like? And then how do you guys sort of think about what to adopt and, and how to address it? Yeah, yeah. So um, my understanding is that like the the big guys that have you know all the money and all the resources, like they they are building their own in, internal. Uh, proprietary systems, but we're actually um, using an off the shelf uh, software product called Veritech. And um, it's uh, just a matter of, you know, implementing it. And, and what it does is it, 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 it can search the internet for local pricing. So if you go on, you know, one, two, three main street storage, uh, dot com, you can see, you know, a lot of times, uh, they'll, they will advertise their pricing for their particular units. So this technology is able to go out and scrape that information uh, from from whatever market you know size that we we tell it to, mm -hmm. and um, and use that information to help us figure out. And of course, I, I'm not a technologist. I'm just, <laughs> I'm a dumb finance guy, but they're able to use that technology to uh, you know figure out like where our pricing should be given the, the dynamics going on in, in the rest of the market. Mm -hmm. um, so it's, it's certainly not perfect, right? Because a lot of the moms and pops, they don't have websites. They don't have websites that show the pricing of their units. And then of course, you know, you're not really sure what the occupancy is, is, you know, what the pricing is, but I think they have some technology that allows them to, to kind of figure out, uh, what the occupancy is. So like if they're offering concessions, right, on a mm -hmm. 10 by 20, like, hey, three months free or something like that, then it tells us, oh, they've got a lot of 10 by 20s available. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and and if and for the for the unit sizes that don't have concessions or promotions or something, then we know, oh, well, they must be pretty full on those. So I, at a high level, Brandon, it's, mm -hmm. that's as that's as good as I can explain it. But uh but yeah. we're excited about it. Like I said, it's yeah. it's just a way for us to uh, make sure we're optimizing our revenue and our efficiency at our facilities. Um, and it really kind of goes back to, um, to it's kind of like a hotel or an airline mm -hmm. model, right? So like I have a friend of mine I went to business school with, his family was in the hotel business and he would say, Hey, if we're, if we're more than 90% full, we're, we know we're not charging enough. Right? Yes, yeah, <laughs> right? exactly. Cause you know, yep. that fixed, yeah, you have that fist, the fixed costs of having this building and the staff and whatever. So it's like, you know, you got to find a way to maximize that revenue. And and for the moms and pops, their big KPI, key performance indicator is, am I full? If yeah. I'm full, awesome. Because the last thing they want to do is any kind of marketing program or website or whatever and have to think about dynamic yeah. pricing and, you know, what have you. So they just want those units full so they can go to the beach or the golf course, right? And so our KPIs are much different. Our KPIs are all about, are we gener are we maximizing the revenue, right? Are we, is our economic occupancy where it should be? You know, what's our delinquency? You know, those kinds of things, so. No, it's it's fascinating. And, and we have to sort of explain that a little bit to, most of our investors that are coming to this space are familiar with multifamily. And so mm -hmm. they're sort of thinking about it the same way that I think the mom and pop self storage Mm -hmm. operators thinking about it so they're looking across the occupancies and they're like 80s like low 80s like what's what's going on here i'm like well no this there is mm -hmm. so it's more of a rev par type metric that we're looking That's at right, right? We're trying to optimize that number not necessarily occupancy so like i feel like it takes a minute to have folks kind of wrap their brain around you know we're we're worried about the bottom line not not admit how many of these units are necessarily full it, it takes That's a right. minute 
I'm going to sort of think about that. But yeah, the hotels and the airlines are, that's, that's a great analogy or a great connection to that, right? They'll get the airline yeah. really fast. Like, well, wait, wait a second. Like the ticket prices are always different. It's like, well, yeah, that's, that's Revit's dynamic pricing in action. The founders of dynamic pricing are our airline friends. That's um, right. Same concept here. It feels like, it feels like storage isn't all the way, has a long way to go to get to that point where it's as dynamic as, as the airlines. Is that a huge advantage at the bare, at the bare basics of the value you're able to add to like a new facility you acquire? Is that really what it's about? Is it optimizing that sort of rev par metric and you just don't see it in those operators that have been doing it before? Is that, is that really what you're encountering the most often? Yeah, I mean that's that's really where the industry's headed, and and it's certainly where we're headed as a company. Uh, we are, you know, hyper focused on you know what can we do to run these facilities better, right? So so using technology, um, not having a, a manager just sitting at a facility that's full that's getting paid, and they're sitting there twiddling their thumbs because at a full facility, you know, you don't need a full time person just sitting there. So we take that one human and we spread them across, you know, three, four, five of our facilities because, you know, they might be managing our, our facility in Wilmington, North Carolina, but they might physically be at our facility in, in, uh, in Bowling Green, Kentucky. But for the, for the most part, if a customer calls in, you know, they're able to handle that customer service inquiry from their smartphone or maybe from their laptop or something like that. So we're, we're able to leverage technology to, to really kind of streamline things and focus in on generating uh, more revenue, uh, but efficiently, right? And so we're able to lower our, our operating expense uh, profile of the facility. So we're generating more net operating income and more value for our investors. No, I love it. I love it. Yeah, it's it's coming. Uh it's coming, but it, we're not we're not quite there yet. What a huge advantage to sort of lean into and continue to lean into um yep. in this space. This is excellent. Mm -hmm. Um what else am I not asking? Is there <laughs> something else you want to share with with our with our audience? This is awesome and just a wealth sure. of information about this space. Um sure. where where can folks find you? Um what's the best way to to go about that? Sure, sure. Yeah, I, uh, I get. I guess I'll tell you. I mean, we've touched uh, kind of around a couple key things, Brandon. Yeah. But I just want to make super clear for the for the audience out there, um, we are early in the stages of uh, self storage. Uh, the demand is growing. So, a couple stats, right? So, a few years ago, about eight percent of households were using self storage. Mm -hmm. These days, because we've got baby boomers selling, we've got millennials who are now in their mid, late, early thirties, early forties. So they're in their prime spending years, right? Mm -hmm. So we have, and they're the largest uh, generation in our society right now. Mm -hmm. um, we also have, I mean, just our, our population's growing in general, right? So we have the makings of, you know, just much more demand going forward in self-storage. So 8% a few years ago is now 11 and a half going on 12% of households. Now, People might say, oh, well, that's only, you know, a three, four percent increase. Well, Brandon, there's 120 million households in the country, right? Every one percent move is 1.2 million new self-storage customers. So that's 3.6 to 4.8 million new self-storage customers. And they, they just can't build them fast enough. Municipalities do not want self-storage primarily. So, mm -hmm. so the supply is constrained. The demand is increasing. That's, I mean, any, I don't care what market you're looking at, you know, that's the kind of dynamic you want to see when you're, when you're an investor, you want to see constrained supply and growing demand. Uh, the other thing that I'd like our investors to know is uh, in terms of capital preservation, which right now I think is really important to focus yeah. on that. Capital preservation is super important. Mm -hmm. When you look at loan defaults, right, mm -hmm. in commercial real estate, you've got uh, you know, you've got hotels. It's always one of the high ones. These days, you've got office, right? Because people aren't going back to the office. So those loans are defaulting. You've got retail strip centers, right? Everything's, everyone's buying everything online now. So a lot of retail strip centers are going, going out of business. Multifamily is very strong. You know, not a lot of defaults there. Self-storage is like pretty much zero, Brandon. Yeah, so if you're an investor and you're, you know, especially if you've lived through the Great Recession or you've had some other challenges in the real mm -hmm. estate world, I mean, to me, as an investor myself, 
like that tells me I've got a little bit of a safety net there as far as, you know, my equity being protected because self-storage facilities don't default. Mm -hmm. So that I think is, is really, really important. And the last thing I'll share is um, self-storage. It's not just a, a fad right now for 40 years, Brandon, self-storage occupancy has gently meandered between like 80 and 90%. So even though, you know, rates have to adjust to, you know, for market conditions and whatnot, I mean, if you think about the last 40 plus years, right, we, I mean, we've had, uh, you know, the internet bubble burst, we've had, you know, we've had the great recession, we've had, you know, boom times, we've had busts, we've had everything in between, but self-storage, it's like that, have you been to the water park, Brandon, you know, you, I, I don't do those, you know, the thrill rides, like where you drop real quick, I like to do the lazy river, right, I like to have my cocktail and my shades on, holding hands with my loved ones, just floating around, getting, catching some rays. That is self-storage yeah. to me. And, and uh, it's just a, a steady asset class has tax benefits and all kinds of great stuff. So. Uh, that's a, that's anyway. an awesome analogy. We pound this home with our clients. Great financial crisis. Only, right. only real estate asset class to increase in value was. Self-storage. Self yeah. Yeah. We won. That's it. Yep. Whole page. Yep. Oh, totally. Okay. Lazy river. <laughs> I like that. I'm using that. I'm still in that analogy. Yeah. This has been awesome. I want to thank you. Where can yeah. folks find you? Where can they connect with you? Yeah, Brandon, this has been great, buddy. I appreciate the opportunity. I'm Tom Dunkel. I'm chief investment officer here at Bell Rose Storage Group. If you Google me, you can find me all over you know, LinkedIn and Facebook and Instagram and that sort of thing. Um, our, our website is full of great information for investors, including um, an ebook. Uh, that we call uh, the safe method, uh, which is a, it's a, of course, investing isn't safe, but safe is an acronym, uh, which stands for sponsor, asset, financials, and exit. Those are all the things as an investor you really need to understand thoroughly. So the ebook gives our investors uh, just questions to ask uh, to make sure they're covered in each of those areas. Um, but that's available on our website, bellrosestoragegroup.com. But yeah, I'd love to connect with the listeners out there. That's awesome. We'll drop a link to that in the show notes. Um, so mm -hmm. people can find that. That's great. Tom, thanks again. This has been really awesome. Thank you, Brandon. Great questions. This has been a lot of fun. Great. And thank you all for listening. Until next time. See you later.